What if we can positively impact society by reshaping the mindsets of young men? And while we're at it, let me ask you, what does it mean to be a man? My name is Dennis Meralda, a father, a teacher, a coach, a mentor, and a principal with over two decades of experience shaping the minds and characters of young men across the United States. If these questions resonate, if you're a young man looking to improve your life or a parent looking for tools to help your son become the best version of himself, the Building Men Podcast was created for you. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Building Men Podcast, or welcome back to the Building Men Podcast if you are a longtime listener, as our guest is today. As always, I'm your host, Dennis Meralda. Happy to be here with Bill Matthews. He is the cornerman coach. He's an enlifted coach. He is a guy who's a little older than me, but he is absolutely ripped. Uh, I met him at the enlifted event and chopped it up with him for a little bit, uh, fell in love with him and his story. And I know everyone that's listening right now will get a ton of value from the conversation you are about to listen to. Bill, what's up, man? Welcome to the podcast. Hey, Dennis. Thanks, man. I really appreciate the opportunity to just share space with you and have a conversation, man. I'm really, I'm super excited. You got it, man. And the conversation that we had, we spoke at the Enlifted event. It was during the uh, Brendan Powell breathwork session, which was a wild thing. I'd never gone through that breathwork thing before in my life. And you and I spoke. Um, and in that conversation, it was just like next level for me to hear how you have been listening to the Building Men podcast and it's had some type of an impact on your life. It was very, very humbling for me to have that conversation with you. I wanted to let you know that first and foremost. And then after the event, I did a little, a little bit more research into you and I was like, this dude's a total badass. I can't, I got to have him on the podcast. The, I want to hear about your story, your message and your journey. So if I'm a listener right now and I jump in an elevator with you, and we're going up to the 93rd floor of a building and they're like, all right, Bill, who are you? Give me the quick elevator pitch. Who are you as you're sitting across from me today? Well, cur currently, I would say, you know, I'm a I'm a 57 year old man in the in the best physical, mental shape of my life. Been married for 31 years. I'm sober for 35 years which means I haven't had a drop of alcohol or any mind altering substance since I was 21 years old. And uh, I'm also a father. I have two children, uh, one a young man that's 26 years old. My, um, his name's William, and I got a 39 year old daughter named Ashley. And I'm just a, a man helping other men my age thrive, you know, teaching them that it's not too late to overcome their limiting beliefs and, and, and begin to, to live again, you know, appreciate that, man. And well, you mentioned that you have been sober since you were 21 years old, which is the legal drinking age, right? And so I have a son uh, who's 18 years old, a daughter who's 16 years old, a daughter who's 13 years old. And I know that that's a pressure that they're going to have, have had many conversations with them about alcohol and drinking and drugs and drug use. And it's such a reality in the building men meetings that I do right now. It's something that I absolutely bring up with kids. So talk to us a little bit about the journey that you went on, like if as you've been sober for this many years, do you remember that first sip of alcohol that you had? Like what was, who were you back in the day when you were abusing the substance? Interesting because growing up, man, I had, you know, I had a great, what I would consider great life, lots of great friends, you know, growing up, played basketball. I mean, I got my first trophy for basketball in 1971. I actually still have it. It's a brass trophy, right? So, but imagine this, it's 1977. Might be a little Peter Frampton, you know, playing in the background. Do you feel like yeah, I yeah, feel? Yeah, 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 exactly. Sisters having a party. I, I, I'm 11 right and some guy hands me a warm tall can of schlitz malt liquor i knew what to do with it because i'd been seeing my parents do it and i drank it and any limiting or any reservations i might have had they disappeared right away you know any nervousness it's like wow i was just like the life of the party and then of course i threw up all over the place that same year I went ice skating with my older brother and he gave me a little tab of paper. He said, put this under your tongue. I'm like, that's just this little piece of paper. What, what, you know, what could that do? I'm 11. Wow. I just took my first hit of acid. 
I'm 11. And what I can tell you, Dennis, is the next 10 years of my life from 11 years old to 21 years was literally a trip, <laughs> as you can imagine, because I chased that feeling that remove all my insecurities and I'm drinking and I'm stealing liquor from my parents. And, and now the buddies that I was growing up with connected with sports and all that just really just drifted away. And I started hanging out with the long haired concert shirt wearing guys, you know, the, the smoking weed. And I became a guy that would take a handful of stuff and then ask what it was. And, uh, the people that mattered most to me in my life weren't even around. And, uh, as they would try to help me and tell me I'm having a problem, I'm saying, you know, I don't have wow. a problem. You're my problem. And I really just completely lost myself and, and I ended up having a meeting the woman of my dreams at 17 years old. And she's three years older than me. By the time I was 18, I had a little girl. My, my daughter was born and, and I, I tried to make it work and make it happen, but we were so both messed up. Uh, that there was no way we could stay together. Right. So then we we separated. I, I just got in a ton of legal trouble, ended up getting a drunk driving at, at 21 years old. And uh, they sent me to rehab. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to rehab for. I just, it sounded better than spending all that time in jail. And that's where I found uh, recovery, 12-step programs. So uh, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you before we uh, get back to the that space when you're when you're in recovery or in rehab first it sounds to me like that would be the loss if you lose a bet you have to drink a warm can of schlitz i mean that sounds absolutely horrible to me but when you taste it you're just like all right this is the golden ticket this is the grail the holy grail of liquid here it was just I, I, my parents were bar owners, so okay. I've seen liquor and beer all my life. And it, I don't know if I felt, uh, peer pressure from these guys. They were yeah. older than me. Um, I just knew, Hey, I'm going to drink it. Cause look, they all are having such a great yep. time. So I want to have a great time to learn more about our programs, including one-on-one -on -one mentorship, coaching, the foundation our Building Men online group community for young men, or to bring a Building Men experience to your school, check out our website, buildingmen.io, or click the links in the bio. Now, back to the show. Was it, was, it, was it romanticized by your family? Was it, did you feel like, you know, it was like, cheers, like everybody knows your name and you see people having a great time, or did you see the the negative side of it, the demon side of it, where you see the guy, you know, the guy hugging the toilet bowl and the girls passed out on the floor. I, I wish it was, it was only that negative side. I mean, no, it wasn't romanticized. It wasn't, let's have a, you know, cheers, you know, uh, it, there was violence in my family. You know, my dad was a serious, serious drinker. We were the kind of guy, you know, uh, family that mom would call and say we're on our way home dad's drunk get everybody out of the house you know and you got to clean up my dad uh love my dad i mean i've worked through a lot of issues yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Dad was, my father was born in 1928 he forged his birth certificate to go into world war ii he was a solid stubborn son of a bitch yeah. man I joke because I say I know my dad loved me because he let me live in his house. There wasn't what we have with our children. Right. Now. And uh, so, you know, mom didn't do what dad asked him her to do. You know, there, there was consequences. So, no, I wasn't. It wasn't all fun and games, but I, I just. I don't know. I just drank it. <laughs> right. It's like I didn't think about those consequences. And those consequences happened to me as well, you know, so. Do you think that you had that genetic disposition where no matter what time in your life that you had that first sip that you were going to go down that path? Or do you think it was because your brain hadn't developed as what you were fifth or sixth grade student, 11 to, you know, 11 years old, 
Um, or do you think it was developmentally like you just weren't capable of making the right decisions? You felt this high from it or, you know, whatever the feeling you felt and you're just like, okay, I like this. I'm going to lean in this direction now. I, I believe that th there might be some genetic component to alcoholism. I don't know if anybody's ever really found the gene. However, it seems like there's a stem of alcoholism in certain families and not in others. But then you see one family, everybody's perfectly normal. But then they have, you know, there's there's Louie over there, hammered, you know what right. I mean? But he's in a great family. Um, I think it was a matter of that feeling of letting go because I was a bit uncomfortable, you know, the 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 nervous guy, the not wanting to talk to girls guy. And man, you take you take a few drinks and some other mind altering chemicals, man, and uh, you can do some. You, you don't have that reservation anymore. But the problem is, is like the pregame was always a little. <laughs> I would always take it a little too far, right? right? And some people don't understand what a blackout is time traveling whatever you want to call it to 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 be having a great time and the next thing you know you're waking up in the morning going this heart-wrenching feeling of oh crap what did like how I did do. i get here and i gotta dread make that phone call to doug like hey doug how are you doing like dude you're not going to believe what you did last night oh, yeah you know what i mean so then you can't hang out with those people anymore. And then pretty soon you're drinking to put out of your mind what you did the last time you were drinking. It's just a perpetual thing. And then there's the addiction component, you know? And like, I think of the, the what you're describing is like Frank the Tank from, from old school, right? And you know, where he's funneling the beer and it's, it tastes so good when it hits your lips. Let's go streak it in the quad, that kind of thing. But like you mentioned, the pregame for you was lasting into the halftime of the of a triple header, and you just kept going and putting your foot on the gas with it. As that, so it was a decade of your life, basically. You're talking about in these formative years when everything is going on, like your brain is developing, you're, you're you know you're going through puberty, everything is happening, and all of that is is like tempered by you know this poison that's a, that's in your body. During that time, was there a space where you're just like I need to stop this. I need to get out of it. How do I get out of it? Or, or were you just like, ah, fuck it. I'll just keep going. The justification for an alcoholic. Well, I didn't never knew I was an alcoholic because an alcoholic lives on the street. He wears a trench coat. He pukes right. on himself. He's got vodka. In his That's an alcoholic. Um, I was just partying. I never wanted to stop because I felt I could, I could stop anytime. You know, I'm a kid. I'm just partying. This is what we do. I don't know anybody that does nothing. Those are squares. Those are nerds. I don't want to be that guy either. You know what I mean? I just got caught up in this, this cycle of what are we doing next? It wasn't, I didn't have a revelation ever until I went and got locked up and went to rehab that, whoa, I got a freaking problem. Right. It, I had to be pulled away from it and like really for the first time, really observe like, Hey, Billy, who are you, man? What is going on with you? Yep. And I mean, to me too, with you, the conversation around your brother, how old is, is, how much older is your brother than you? Five years older. And are you still, do you still have a relationship with him? Yeah. We're okay. not as close as, as we want and and i have three older brothers too so dad was married before had a few kids so and, and I, what's wild about that in 1983 dennis we got a phone call on christmas day so in 1983 i my, one of my brothers passed away so he was 32 years old and he drank himself to death wow so um you would think that hey you know Maybe I should take a look at myself, but see, at, at that time, I, I'm not an alcoholic. In 1983, I'm freaking 17 years old. You know, I'm my party's just getting ready to yep. start. And you're probably like, you know what? I'm going to have a couple of drinks just to numb the pain of the feeling that I'm having from my older brother passing. So your your older brother had you try acid when you were 11 years old, put this under your tongue and see how you feel. Have you ever closed the loop with him about that experience, how that you know, could have had a really detrimental effect on the, the next 30 plus years of your life. I mean, we've laughed about it. 
we've never said, dude, I can't even believe he did that. There was never any blame or, or okay. anything because I was a willing participant. Right. And trust me, that's not the last time I did it. We used right. to take acid every weekend and go play tag in the forest. You know what I mean? It, I, if I <laughs> talking to a normal person about my experiences and who they're talking to now, they, they're like, it's like two different worlds. They're like, right. what? no way. You know what I mean? It's uh, it's really wild because I've seen people take acid one time and never come back. Like it just snapped them. Not to romanticize it, but I'm just curious. We've all we all had that moment where like I can't believe that I did that. Like I'm thinking of uh, trading places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd when he's wearing the Santa Claus suit and he pulls like a raw salmon out of his thing and he eats it <laughs> through his beard. It's just a total disaster. Do you have that moment? Can you remember that one time where as you look back, like this is going to go in the Bill Matthews book one day, this, I can't believe I did this or went through this experience. There's so many just minor things. I don't have just one right. big experience. You know what I mean? So if you, okay. if you had an opportunity built to, well, two things, I'll two part question here. I, I, I hear this one often and I'll, I'll tag team it with another, but say you have an opportunity to go back and talk to bill as a 17 year old kid right you know during this time you just find out you know, it's 1983 time frame you have an opportunity to talk to bill then what what would you say to him and what what would he say to you like what if, if that guy could give you advice so you could give your 17 year old self advice and if he if there was any piece of advice that he might be able to give to you right now what would that conversation look like it's really funny because based on how we're talking about it, and I've never heard it the reverse, what would he say to me? Right. I'm curious about that too. Uh, the the thought of what would I, I say to him, it's uh, first off, I'd say, don't do it. Right. <laughs> don't take it. Don't. You have no idea the rabbit hole that you're going to go, you're going to go down that you don't, you don't need mind altering chemicals to to relax there's there's other ways and i would just let him know it's going to be okay you know what i mean it's just going to be okay and then he would be like go fuck yourself <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> exactly he'd be telling me like hey we're just partying we're just gonna we're just having a good time right. you know uh it's interesting because like, what would little Billy say to 57 year old right. Bill? I would, this could be a, right now in the, in the frame, he would tell me I'm freaking proud of you, man. Yeah. I'm freaking proud of you for making the change for putting it down and then dedicating your life to helping other people. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's one of those things where my suggestion would be we get off this write that down write the letter from 17 year old billy to 57 year old billy you know powerful thing to do right there so now fast forward to you have this moment when you're 20 21 years old and it's you know this moment where you, you know you find yourself in this crazy space rehab jail you know recovery talk to us a little bit about what that looks like for you well, when I landed in this rehabilitation center, I, I didn't really think about what I was being in rehabilitated. I really never put it all together. And then I went to my, my first 12 step meeting and they literally described what an alcoholic was, you know, that it's an obsession with the mind coupled with an allergy of the body. And when you're not drinking, you think about drinking. When you start drinking, you don't know when you're going to stop. That really is what an alcoholic is. And that once they read that, I was, I had this overwhelming, oh crap, I'm a freaking alcoholic. That was devastating. I'm yeah. six months into 20, being 21. But once I, I, I got that realization and then all of a sudden I start putting stuff together, I realized, man, I got to quit drinking. It really has been this devastating you know liquid that i've been drinking since i'm 11 that has just destroyed my life and it really at that point was the first time i ever said i'm gonna stop i had no idea that like i would never drink again up to this point i mean you're talking 35 years i've not had a drink wow 
And after that time, after you like made that decision, that was it for you. That you never fell off the wagon. I've never had a wow. drink since the first time I, I I came to that decision. But I surrounded myself with a with a bunch of other guys. I mean, I got I just got off the phone with a friend. We we've, we've been together and buddies doing this for he's thirty four years, you know, sober. And so I got this tribe of men that we support one another. You know, when you got a common thread like that and like, hey, we're all in this together, that that's why CrossFit works. That's why in lifted works. It's because we're all moving in the same yep. direction. You got support, you know? It's that community idea. And and Bill, you mentioned you would tell that 17 year old Billy that there are other ways that you can go about achieving a similar feeling, not the same exact feeling of getting higher, being drunk, but there are other ways to meet that need. What are those other ways? Like, what would you say to a kid who's 17 years old right now? It's like, I'm just going to go get banged up this weekend. It's no big deal. What are the other things that they could be doing? A con <laughs> be I want to say become comfortable with the uncomfortable the reward of pushing through discomfort and coming through the other side of the authentic like i just accomplished something amazing that high to me now is better than any high i could have had back then 100 percent agree with that and so for the next what 24 years of your life you you know you were on a specific path or whatever and then all of a sudden you're 45 years old and something changes right you you have this like epiphany there was like a you know a moment that you decided to change something in your life so talk to us first about those two and a half decades from 21 to 45 and then when you decided you picked up running all of a sudden like what was that journey like for you during that time the 21 to, to 45 i you know getting sober and then i met I met the woman of my dreams, you know, I, I met my wife in 1991, we went on our first date. And in 1992, literally 12 months later, we got married, I'm 23, she's 26. Right? I have this, maybe four or five year old daughter that I, I got back in my life. Now I have her every other weekend. I'm I'm dad, I it's just, I'm, I'm doing everything that we're, we're supposed to do. I get the job, I get the car, and then I get the better car. And I just, I'm living what I think is the life I'm supposed to live. You know, I buy the home. I'm then we have a son and that's a whole nother story. We had five miscarriages and, wow. and she has little William and, uh, it was a miracle, right? It's like, wow, now we have a, a son and, and together we're raising him and, and we're owning the home. I have a great job with a you know big corporation. I, I worked for a, a large uh, potato chip manufacturer for years. I, I could say it. I worked for Frito-Lay for freaking 20 years, right? Um, so on the outside, Dennis, I freaking got it made. Yeah, American dream. Making, I'm making great money. I have a beautiful home. I'm married for 19 years. I'm sober for 25 years. I got kids. And everybody on the outside is like, dude, man, how lucky are you? But the man I saw in the mirror, I was not proud of. Because I chased what everybody else thought. I'm supposed to have, I'm supposed to do all these things and get in line with everybody. What I really was, was I was 45 years old. I was 222 pounds. I was, and it was all in my gut. You, you know what I mean? I'm drinking another rock star, another monster energy drink. I'm smoking cigarettes. I'm sitting on the couch. I'm working and coming home and not doing much of anything. If my buddy said, hey, you want to go play flag football? I'm like, no, I got to work. But that was a lie. I couldn't run and play flag football if I wanted to. I had lost any notion of being an athlete it was it had disappeared i had worked out off and on through those years but never really took care of myself and and i lost myself in all of this outside stuff and that affected me as a man my relationship with my wife my relationship with my children because i didn't feel good about myself and i don't know how i had an aha moment or or, or what happened but all i know is there was a treadmill 
in my living room. And I'm like, I'm going to go run a mile on that treadmill. Now, I played basketball my whole life. Nobody runs on purpose. You run laps when you get in trouble, you know, playing sports. Suicides. <laughs> yeah, it's like, that's not what I'm going to do. But I got on that treadmill, man, and wow, man, I liked how that made me feel like I, I was doing something for myself and it actually felt good. And I did it again and then again. And before you know it, I'm outside running and I'm like, man, this, I feel alive. And then all of a sudden, you know, some weight started falling off. And then it was just like, hey, I wonder what I could do with this. I'm like naturally good at it. Like I'm going to run a half marathon. Oh man, I'm going to run a marathon. What's next? Another marathon, another marathon. And then I was going to give up running. And then I found a magazine called Trail Running Magazine. I'm like, you can run in the mountains? What? That didn't make, like, I had no idea. And that's when I found the love of freaking ultra trail running. That has been a game changer for me. And now I've run multiple 50 milers, multiple 100 mile foot races. And, and, uh, the first one was, uh, the, the first hundred miler was uh, a commitment I made to my mother and that's why I did it. Wow. It's interesting too, Bill. Like I think about when you had that moment of looking at yourself in the mirror, uh, there's a famous poem called the man in the glass and the, yeah. the last stanza says you may fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartache and tears. If you've cheated the man in the glass. And what you did was you took that hard look at yourself, something that certainly resonates with me as I went through something similar about three years ago now, uh, where I was almost four years ago now, wow, uh, where I was taking that same look at myself, didn't like who I saw, was making the same excuses, the comfortable lifestyle. When it was time for a change, you basically tired of your own bullshit and you have to, and it starts with the movement. So getting up and getting on the treadmill, whatever it was that called to you in that moment, so it's, I, I believe it's the movement has to happen. And then it's repeating that same thing. You know, the com the confidence doesn't come. The motivation doesn't come. The movement, the action has to come. And we know action dispels overwhelm. So you need to start moving. And then you just repeat those steps and you start increasing, you know, the, the frequency of it. You start increasing like the tenacity that you have to put forth to accomplish that goal. So if I'm a guy now, so I'm a parent of a, you know, of a middle school, high school age kid, I'm listening to this podcast and I'm you at 45 years old, you know, I, everything looks a certain way. I got the job, I the car, the house looks a certain way, you know, me and my wife are somewhat happier. So it looks so on Instagram or Facebook. What, what would you say to that person to get, to help them get up and get moving? What's the, is there a magic thing that you can say, or is it, does that truly have to come from inside? It definitely has to come inside, but I just ask them, you know, I, I have people, they're like, well, what if I'm satisfied, you know, what if I'm satisfied with my weight and, and I don't want to lose weight and I'm good. I'm like, Hey, if you love yourself and you feel good about yourself, that's awesome. But I would ask you a question. Is your current physical, you know, uh, situation limiting you from doing things that you actually want to do? Are you not doing things that you would like to do? because of your weight or pain or whatever, can you get down on your hands and knees and play with your kids? Can you chase your dog? Can you go hike with your wife? Or have you settled for a life that doesn't include those things because your, your, your weight or your, your physical pain. And then all of a sudden they're like, wow, I really do have an issue. But the message really is, I want to let people know that it's not too late. We, we deal with these limiting beliefs that, Oh, you can't gain muscle. You can't get in shape at, at that age. It's like, it's too late, man. You're over the rainbow. You're on the downside. Just, just give it up. And that's where men, then they really, you know, some of them turn to drug addiction or drinking because they're just looking for these dopamine hits, or maybe it's buy another car or buy another thing. Those things will not fix you long-term. They're quick fixes. And I would just encourage them to do to get moving, like you said, it's like when you get moving, those are the feel good drugs that you're looking for in all those outside things. You know, happiness is never an outside in thing. It's always an it, it's an inside out thing. 
absolutely. And it's, uh, I use this with educators a lot when they're talking about moving, you know, the needle with kids in their class. It's slow is smooth and smooth is fast. It takes a little while to get it going, but once you get it going, like you're pushing the rock up the hill and it's going to eventually roll down on the other side. It's that consistency too. Like you mentioned, I mean, for me, I was telling Jewel the other day, right now in my life, I'm, I'm stronger than I have ever been. I'll be 47 years old in a month. When, by the time this podcast airs, I'll, I'll be 47 years old already. I'm stronger than I've been ever in my life. And it's, it wasn't just like, okay, I'm just going to start lifting again after years of taking it off or just kind of throwing in the towel with it or half-assing it. I was, I made a commitment to get stronger in many different ways. And like I, now it's to the point where like, I don't, I won't miss my four days at the gym during the week. Like I, that's super consistent for me. And the feeling that I have is way better than the feeling of any high or any, you know, amount of alcohol that I could have. So that certainly resonates with me as well. So I appreciate you taking us through that whole, you know, time warp in your life and the journey that you went on. I could see there was a couple of times you got emotional during that conversation as well, which is a really positive thing for men, in my opinion, to, to lean into those things. So it leads me to a question about Enlifted. When did you first hear about Enlifted and why did you feel connected or called to it? So my original, you know, focus was just physical fitness, physical right. fitness. And I came, became a personal trainer and I'm, I'm training men online and, but I, I, you know, through my journey became, you know, really went through the, down the rabbit hole of mindset and discipline, you know, the David Goggins and the yeah. Jockos, and all of that stuff. But I just became a podcast listener and through podcast, Joe Rogan and, and Aubrey Marcus and all these things, I, now I'm listening to physical fitness ones. And I, I found Ben Bergeron and chasing excellence and they had Mark and Kimberly on. And I'm like, what is this? You know, and this is, they're talking about soft talk. I'm like, I've never heard anybody talk about words yeah. like this, like kind of sort of maybe one day. And I'm like, man, I catch myself saying that and the people around me. And then I just started everything I could, I could see Mark at or listen to Mark. I'm, I'm finding because I'm realizing that oh my God, I'm casting spells. I'm, I'm a spell caster. I'm like, I'm telling myself these things of limiting beliefs and I'm, I'm telling them to, I just became super aware. And I was like, man, I'm going to check into becoming in lifted certified. Yeah. Right. And then the rest is, <laughs> I've just been level one, level two, and, and really have added that into my coaching business. And it, it just works across the board. And in level one, you really get into uh, the self-limiting beliefs and you start to name the little devil that sits upon your shoulder that just talks all those negative things into your, into your ear. And during the um, Unlifted event, one of the things that I talked about were the three thieves and the first being resistance. And I like personified resistance as this gigantic hulking figure, but has a colleague or a partner and it's the little devil that sits on your shoulder and it's just constantly talking shit to you. And we name that, that person that sits on your shoulder. We, and we, what does it say to you? What is, you know, what has it got you to do? And if you continue to listen to this person, what's in store from you. And I do that with the boys that I work with, like they go through that whole process. And then with the groups, I do the same exact thing. And it, it, it's transferable. It's not just adults that it works with. It works with kids. And what I argue is that if we can get kids to start to see those self limiting beliefs before they graduate from high school or college, even what what a service that we're doing to them the second step in lifted is that whole idea of the corner man and and who's on your shoulders it's like mickey saying to rocky get up you son of a bitch right it's it's that person and i found it interesting that on your instagram handle it's corner man coaching so talk to us a little bit about bill bill matthews who is your corner man what does he say to you and you know what what's in store for you if you keep listening to him well, yeah, that part of Enlifted, and and I was like, why do they got to call it the Little Billy story? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that is my that is my voice. Yeah. How many of us our whole lives never realized that we have that voice, or that voice really isn't us, but yet we've been allowing it to dictate our decisions or our and, and minimize our choices my whole life so that was an unbelievable awareness and then yeah it's like hey can if that's just a story 
and a made up thing in my head can i replace it with this this corner man and my my coaching business it is called the corner man because of that because i was literally walking a man through little billy doing celebrating the wins and now we're at corner man coaching and i ask him the question who's your corner man if you had a corner man what does he look like what does he say how does he dress he says this is easy it's you you're the voice in my head when i want to give up wow i'm like hold man you just like changed the name and the the you know the uh, just how i view my coaching because most men know what a freaking corner man is and who doesn't want someone in their corner so that is literally what i'm doing i'm reaching out to other men and saying hey i've been in the ring i've been punched in the face and i've gotten back up i want to help you do the same thing right so to replace the voice of limiting beliefs now replacing that voice of hey what if the good shit happens what if this really freaking works out? What happens if you just keep going and not give up? And this really, Dennis, this theory of embrace the uncomfortable. Because on the other side of uncomfortable is freaking comfortable. In every year of first podcast, you were very uncomfortable. Today, I'm seeing a man that's calm, cool, collected. So what was once uncomfortable becomes becomes comfortable. And that's every aspect however most men or people i don't want to be uncomfortable i don't want to fail what if i can't do it what what are they going to say but man everything good on my life in my life has come on the other side of being uncomfortable at first it's that fixed or or growth mindset right so it's like in be willing to put yourself on the hook to, to, to be uncomfortable. And that happens on the other side of just saying, yes, yes, I'll show up. Yes, I'll try. So any man, woman, child, listen to this, say yes, because that puts you in the arena, the arena for freaking magic to happen. Everything happens on the other side of saying yes. Saying no is easy. Sitting on the couch like I did for all those years, not putting myself in the arena, not not being willing to do anything uncomfortable kept me stuck and disconnected from the one person that means the most. And that's me. Love so that, I'm dude. encouraging anybody, man, embrace. I just carried a 28 or I just carried a 45 pound kettlebell everywhere I went for 28 days. And people are like, what? Like I ran a hundred mile foot race, came home. I'm like, what's next? I saw this kettlebell in my, in my my living room and i said what happens if i carry that everywhere i go for 28 days i'm like i don't know but I, let's do it and i had no idea what like everywhere so i can let you know you can take a kettlebell into costco and carry it around you're going to get some funny looks but it's okay i took it to the doctor's office i got my hair cut the biggest realization dennis and, and this comes back to being uh to embracing uncomfortable is that I go to a big men's meeting, man, on Thursday nights. There is no short of shit talking, guys. We know those guys. We are those guys. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I brought it, and I'm like, Bill, are you going to carry it in there? Nah, no way. What are they going to say? I'm The light bulb went off. I'm like, holy crap. That's exactly why you're going to freaking carry the kettlebell in there. Because how long are you going to live your life worried about what other people think? I carried it in there. In fact, I shared about it. I said, hey, listen, you might not have seen me carry it in here, but you're going to see me carry it out. And you're going to see me bring it in here three more times. And why I'm bringing it in here is an example of to, to you and to myself of how long are you going to live your life worried about what other people think of you? I said, you know how much stuff I've done in my life that I didn't want to do? Hey, jump off that cliff, grab that rope. You might die, but don't be weak. So I did things I didn't want to do. On the flip side, there was a ton of things I did want to do, but I was worried what you might think. And I said, I'm not living that way anymore. And I told the guys, I said, you think the guy with the handlebar, the handlebar mustache could give a crap what you think about him? Hell no. He's rocking that damn thing. And most of you wish you were him. Right. 
So I'm encouraging you, whatever you are thinking about doing, but worried what other people think, stop. Because in the end, when this is all over, they ain't going to be around. And the last thing you're going to say is, man, I'm sure glad I lived in the box that everybody thought I should be in. I'm telling you, embrace the uncomfortable and become comfortable. Maybe it's wearing a hot pink shirt to school or work. Do it. How does it feel? Because there's a lot of people, Dennis, that cannot put down their uncomfortable, their, their skin color, their handicaps. There's going to be things in my life that I have to, I get to just embrace that uncomfortable. That's awesome, dude. It, it resonates with me on so many levels. First, I'll start with the the, the latter and, and, and with the foreman. And I mean, it, if you were to tell me five years ago that I'd be up on stage at an event as a featured speaker in Richmond, Virginia, wearing hot pink pants, I would tell you, you're absolutely crazy. There's no way in hell that I am that person that could do something like that. But God damn it, I was. And it, to me, that was that embody that whole thing, not worrying about what other people thought about it, you know, and, and it, to me, it was like this uh, alter ego effect that it had on me. Like I can handle a situation like this. The other thing I wanted to talk about was first of all, like the carrying around a kettlebell everywhere. It's that is badass. It is I will talk about like grip strength and cardiovascular health. And um, when I was, when I was training for the Spartan a year, a year ago now, a little bit longer than a year ago, it was October 2nd that I did the Spartan. Um, a lot of it was like, you had to carry, there was sandbag carries. There was like heavy bucket carries and a lot of grip strength stuff that you're doing monkey bars and rings and ropes and things. And a lot of the advice I get was work on your grip strength. And I'm like, okay, carrying a kettlebell that definitely works on your grip strength. So there was um, a lake. It was a seven mile around lake and i carried the kettlebell around seven miles dude it was one of the hardest things i've ever done before it took you know it took a long time to get through that it was like two hours of carrying the kettlebell and i went from right arm to left arm to right shoulder to left shoulder yeah. and by the time i got to the end of it i mean i could barely you know open up the car door but what a, an accomplishment to be able to do something like that and it wasn't for fanfare or anything like i wanted to prove myself i could do that so what a great opportunity Pick, go pick up something heavy and just carry it around, not worrying what other people think. So I'm sure you got a ton of weird looks and, and whatever, but physically, like what, after the 28 days of doing that, did you notice any difference in just the way you were able to I perform? got serious calluses on yeah. my hands, what I got. But yeah, my grip strength, and that is actually a, a great signal for all-cause mortality, grip strength. As you get older, you want to be able to keep grip. So, but that's a whole different thing. But yeah, my shoulders, everything, you know, you're working your core carry, just farmers carries in general. And I didn't, guys were like, hey, why didn't you pick a 21 or a 20 pounder? I'm like, because that would have been easy. And what you said is how you felt at the end. That's what we want to encourage any female man, young. On the other side of that is like that reward that I was looking for in liquor and drugs. Yes. It's like, this is like... Man, what I have today, when I go to bed tonight, it don't wear off. I don't have to go chase it again. It's like accomplishing these things, man. And they don't even just have to be mental things. When I tell people about this, it's like, I don't put your, go to school, ask for the promotion, start your own business. Uh, Cause on the other side of that is what, who, you know, that, that real reward playing it safe <laughs> really doesn't. It, it will not pay off in the end, man. You know, uh, there's that book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. And that's one of, one of those things, man. I wish I would have went for it. The other key thing on that book is like, I wish I would have allowed myself to be happier. Yeah. Like that is just a weird sentence to hear someone say, like, what do you mean? I wish I would have allowed myself to be happier. That's what in lifting and all, like, take a freaking breath man like like michael singer says this this life that we have on this planet this is god's version whatever you might believe this is that version that that creator's version of freaking disneyland we're supposed to be here having fun and if you're not it ain't no one else's fault but our own i love it and the other thing is when you wake up 
after doing a you know a hard thing you put yourself in an intentionally uncomfortable situation you come out on the other side you don't have the hangover you don't have you have to wake up with that pounding headache and throwing up and having to make the phone call to doug and say what the hell did i do last night you are saying look what i did yesterday and i'm going to do something a little bit better today this is an awesome yeah yeah go ahead on the other side of that, instead of me calling other people saying, oh, my God, what did I do? People are now asking, Bill, what are you doing? And I, I, I search for a purpose. You know, everybody, I want, and here's my purpose, to inspire with my actions because, they're, because other people are watching all the time. And to encourage with my words, because with my words I create, we have the power to encourage other people with our voice to do fantastic things, to build them up, to encourage them to do amazing things. And then on the other thing is to serve with love, man. I'm just here to, I just want to be of service. I was a taker all my life. Take, take, selfish, self-centered during those youth years. Now I am giving back love that abracadabra i mean it's uh, with my words i create one thing that i love about what you do too as well bill is you are the true corner man i mean i see so many guys in this space that they're they're trying to inspire through shaming and guilting people that are going through the journey like look at you fat ass with that beer and that gut look at me i'm walking around without a shirt on this is what i like you're doing it by saying like, I have been through what you're going through and I've come out on the other side and I I've seen the devil and I like the other side a little bit better. And here's how you can go about doing it by by being that corner man on someone's shoulder. So, uh, dude, this has been an awesome hour for me to, to listen to you, to get inspired the whole kettlebell thing. It resonates with me. I mean, I go on a walk every morning. I put on a weighted vest and I walk a couple miles. Why not grab a kettlebell? and go on the walk it'll make it a little bit harder when i get back i'll you know i'll be in a little bit more pain but that's the good stuff so um up for the next 28 walks that i do bill i'm going to grab a kettlebell and i'm going to think about you every morning i just wanted to to let you know that you've, you've certainly inspired me uh before i ask my last question bill where can we find you how do we reach out to you and get in touch with you best way to to find me is on instagram i'm on instagram at, at corner man coaching and uh you can look at my name, Bill Matthews. It'll take you to the same place. That's I, I post there every day, whether it be an inspirational quote. I, I write every day, so I put that stuff out there too. And and uh, I also um, put encouraging videos, whatever. That's where I'm at. So right. and if there, if I could be of service to anybody, if, if anything resonated, and I can help encourage you to take a step forward, just DM me, man. Just 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 get on there. I I'd love to communicate with anybody interested. And so, Bill, when you when you post up on Instagram, there's also you, you have like a couple books that you have a, a, like in the background, and one of them is um, "End Your Story, Begin Your Life." Talk to us a little bit about that book, real quick. It was something I just thought about as you were saying that. So, talk like yeah. that that's that book, or even another book that you might recommend. Well, I mean, I I'm I'm an avid reader uh, about mindset, and and that book I literally just started, and it literally just is in line with the the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. We know that to be the the true description of mindset. You're the story you tell yourself about yourself yeah. to yourself. However, you're not that story. Separate. So this book is really about separating yourself from that story, that narrative, and to become the observer, as Michael Singer in The Untethered Soul would say, become the watcher. Like that's just the roommate living in your head, that voice. So that book is really geared towards that. But I, like I said, I'm an avid reader. So I post pictures of books. I want to encourage people to read. Hey, five pages a day. Just read five pages of any book. You're going to read a 150 page book a a month. Just start with five pages. Anybody could read five pages of a book. And I typically would encourage people to read a nonfiction book, something that you could learn from in in a skill, because why not take the vast amount of information that somebody gathered their whole life and they're saying, here, take my experience. And it's a lost art. I like reading. The um, what you just said reminded me of a guy I've had on the podcast more than once. His name is Akshay Nanavati. He's the author of the book Fearvana, and he talked on the podcast about that whole idea. And he said, "You are not your thoughts. 
You are not your feelings. You are not your experiences. You are the thinker of your thoughts, the feeler of your feeling, and the experiencer of your experiences. So that all wraps in together. Last question, Bill, is if someone's listening to the podcast right now, loved you, loved your story, loved the corner man idea, and they hit stop on the podcast, what's one thing that these people listening can do to change the trajectory of their life? Don't negotiate with the voice in your head. <laughs> Stop negotiating. If you set your alarm tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. because you want to get up and work out or walk or read, whatever it might be, that voice is going to say, nah, hit the snooze button. Don't negotiate. Just get up. The voice that tells you don't go for the promotion. What if you don't? Don't listen to the voice. The voice that might tell you, don't ask that that girl, that, that hottie that you've been wanting to, to ask out on a date. Just walk forward, go forward towards that. Just walk through that because that negotiator or that voice has got you where you are today. And if you don't like where you're at today, it's because you've been letting that voice make the decisions for you. So stop negotiating with that voice. Tremendous piece of advice, my man. This has been an awesome hour. Bill Matthews, thank you so much, my man. Building Man audience, go one step further than you thought you could go. We'll see you next time on Building Men. Building Men.